with. Okay, so apoptosis is uh, a phenomenon that you should hopefully be familiarized with. We always say programmed cell death, but I kind of like the description of it as being more of an altruistic cell death. This was a very significant, uh, I think, concept in terms of evolutionary biology, because when you look at, at I'm a huge fan of, of Lynn Margulis, and I'm a huge fan of Nick Lane, despite how terrible his last book was, but that's beyond the point. When you had endosymbiosis happen, when eukaryotes acquired that mitochondria, that did a lot of things. You know, it gave us more ATP, it gave us protection from oxidation, and it gave us better signaling. And as a consequence of that, really the consequence of the more ATP and the better signaling, we were able to divide up our labor better as, as cells, and, and really that's what led to multicellular life forms. And and one of the, the problems with this, the problem with having all these specialized types of cells is that it's kind of hard to get them all to orchestrate and coordinate in the same similar fashion. And so one of the ways that we can control them and stop them from growing out of control, you know, like with cancer, is through the process of apoptosis. So apoptosis is involved in a lot of things. It's involved in development, which development and cancer are really, really similar. Like, uh, for example, you, you know, your hand, probably all heard the story that your hand starts off kind of like as webbed and then over time that the tissue dies off. But also your brain, your brain develops a lot by killing neurons, which is kind of sad to think about for, for me anyways. But if let's say that a cell gets infected with cancer or, or some type of a toxin or something like that inside of it, it will altruistically kill himself through apoptosis to prevent the spread of any other type of, you know, infectious virons or, or things like that. But it's also just a means of maintaining homeostasis. It's a normal process for certain cells that are, you know, just by the nature of their condition, put under a lot of stress. So what exactly happens? Well, in the process of apoptosis, this cell is going to shrink up, the cytoskeleton is going to collapse, the chromosomes are going to be fragmented, and macrophages are going to be signaled. So we're going to kill ourselves, we're going to make sure that we don't infect anyone else, and we're going to signal the cleanup crew to come in and take care of the problem. Problem. So how does this work? Like I said, a lot of this pathway evolved from the development of the mitochondria. And so one of the things that the common protein that's involved with this are known as Bax proteins. For example, the BCL XL, which we'll be seeing, I think this right here, if you can zoom in on this picture, that's a BCL, not a BDL. Uh, BCL2 is I think right here. Both of these guys are involved in the apoptosis pathway. And these guys are going to ultimately, uh, when they change their conformation and their signal to become, you know, start inducing apoptosis, they're going to create holes in the mitochondrial membrane. Very powerful cytochrome C is going going to be involved in this. Cytochrome C is involved with that reactive oxygen species cascade, which is going to result in activation of caspases. And once you have caspases being activated, you're going to activate, you know, DNases, a whole bunch of other proteins that are going to initiate all of this process here and they have a nice tidy corpse that we can clean up. Now, I always mispronounce this name, but caspases, and yes, I have phonetic dyslexia, don't make fun of me, comes from the name because it's a cysteine aspartic acid protease. And there's multiple different types of them. There's multiple different ones. For example, and the one that I just mentioned here with the Janus kinases, the cytochrome C on the activating caspase 9, but the fast ligand works on caspase 8, and then a whole bunch of other things. You can go into my immunology videos if you're that interested in a contextual example of this. Okay, so for reasons that I don't quite understand, the textbook doesn't go into a lot of depth on this concept. They just list the, the details of it. And so I'm not going to really stress the individual identities of each and every one of those. But notice that the caspase cascade starts with an initiator caspase clustering, and they'll probably do some type of a self-activation or autoproteolysis, and initiators are going to start to cleave the effector caspase. And that's what we're seeing here. So these initiator procaspase clump together, they activate it through some type of a signaling cascade here, which activates the cascade here and convert the pro-effector caspase to the active effector caspase, which ultimately results in not only DNA fragmentation, but breakdown and clumping of cytoskeleton, right? And so apoptosis inhibitors are things that are going to block both the aggregation and then the actual enzymatic activity of the caspase. 